Hi, everyone. Welcome to our 19th CRWDP webinar. Uh, our presentations today are going to run a bit differently than they usually do. We have two speakers today, uh, and I'll introduce them shortly. Before that introduction, though, after the presentations, we'll have our usual Q&A. So our two presenters, our first presenter is Mika Kuhorn. Mika is a professor in occupational and environmental health in the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia. She is also co-director of the Partnership for Work, Health and Safety, a research partnership between UBC and the Workers' Compensation System in British Columbia. Mika's research focuses on the determinants of work-related injury, illness and disability, the investigation of gender and sex differences in workers' compensation experiences, and the impact of precarious employment on work and health outcomes. Our second speaker, whose first name I cannot pronounce properly uh, in, in the original language, is Rodrigo Finkelstein. Rodrigo is a PhD candidate in the School of Communication at Simon Fraser University. He's the author of Labor Risks, A Cultural View. His research interests include the political economy of health information, discourse of health and safety, Marxism, and Marxian political economy. As a Marxist scholar, he has been concerned with making his academic research practical. He has taken unionized positions to advance workers' health and safety interests. Rodrigo's major honor being fired for reporting work injuries and defending his fellow workers' health mm -hmm. and safety rights at a workers' compensation board. So I will turn this over to Mika, uh, and then we'll hear from Rodrigo after. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Dan. And uh, thanks everybody for joining and for the opportunity. Um, I just want to pause here to thank some of the individuals who also contributed to the research that I'll be presenting today, uh, both from UBC and colleagues from Alberta. I do want to start with uh, a land acknowledgement that I am presenting to you uh, from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people here in Vancouver. And I also want to let people know that some of the research that I will be presenting um, uh, uh, today was supported in part with funding from WorkSafe BC, which is the workers' compensation system in British Columbia, just uh, full disclosure. Uh, my purpose this morning in the next kind of 20, 25 minutes is I just want to share with people snapshots of uh, the impacts of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, for workers um, and, and where possible to investigate differences by workers' characteristics. Um, and I'm going to be sh sharing some snapshots that have relied on existing data sources, uh, data that was already in place um, uh, by Statistics Canada, uh, some examples that have relied on novel data sources such as media reports for research purposes, and some of the work is my work, work that I've done with my colleagues out here, and some of it is work by others. Um, I'll share those references and links with you whenever I refer to that kind of work. Um, I think I'm going to start here that this should be no surprise, I think, to the majority of people who are living uh, in the global pandemic, that this pandemic has had has magnified and exacerbated inequities for workers, especially those with additional vulnerabilities. And the examples I'm going to show today are going to illuminate that. And that's probably no surprise to most of you in the room. And the reason that I am choosing to um, highlight those examples this morning is that this is an opportunistic time to implement change um, with regards to long-standing issues around employment standards or sick leave benefits or employment insurance. And I continue to want to highlight the issues because I do think um, it's an opportunistic time to try and make some of these changes that have really brought these issues to the forefront in a meaningful way. So those are my conclusions up front, and then I'm just going to now uh, back those up. Um, I'm going to start first with a focus on sick leave benefits in particular, and some of this also refers to working from home. Um, this is uh, work that we've analyzed from Statistics Canada data already before the pandemic occurred and highlighted this issue. 
Um, but demonstrating data from Statistics Canada General Social Survey from uh, 2016 data already that, um, you know, almost the majority, more than the majority of workers report no employer paid sick leave benefits. This ranges across provinces um, with the highest percentage in uh, British Columbia. And those are the blue bars um, here with no access to sick leave benefits. And also the percentage of workers who report that they cannot work from home. So two really important issues that have been highlighted from a public health standpoint, but that have been long standing employment issues um, and that have been magnified by this public health issue. So this is data that we were already talking about even before the pandemic hit. I just wanna share with you now some additional examples uh, this is work um, from uh, uh, work that we are doing with uh, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. So I was engaged to help with them on a survey that they have been doing focused on precarious employment in British Columbia. This was just before the pandemic was full blown in British Columbia. So it was administered just at the end of 2019. Um, and you can see that even since 2016, very little has changed in terms of this issue, uh, with the majority of workers uh, reporting no paid sick leave benefits. And what this graph highlights is the inequities or the vulnerabilities. You can see that percentage, um, the differences amongst those who earn uh, the least amount of money, employment earnings, compared to those uh, who earn the most amount of money in employment and a clear gradient uh, with regards to our most vulnerable workers with the least earnings and also having the least access to these kinds of important benefits. And we know now the implications of that in the global pandemic and the pressures to attend work, even if one is feeling sick, um, because you feel like you don't have a choice, you're going to learn or lose earnings and have no sick leave benefits to compensate when you're already earning the least amount of money. Um, I'm going to highlight for you one more instance of this. Um, uh, this is work that I was not directly engaged with, but from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives again. Um, uh, in, this case, looking at the labor force survey data and all this to say, um, you know, that uh, this issue persists. It hasn't shifted in a long time, but there's a lot of attention on it now. In this case, from the labor force survey, um, the percentage of people reporting that illness or disability leave was paid for by employers. And again, showing that it's not great overall. Um, it, in terms of having this kind of meaningful benefit and that it's even worse for individuals who earn the least amount of money. I'm just switching back now. I want to draw attention. Uh, this is work that we continue to do with the general social survey from Statistics Canada, where we were trying to look at the predictors or the determinants of not having employer paid benefits. And when you enter in all the variables into a statistical model, things like age and sex um, and uh, family status, um, occupation, those kinds of variables, some of the strongest determinants of not having sick leave benefits and not having any benefits at all, including sick leave benefits for disability or medical benefits, were characteristics related to precarious employment. So adjusting for everything else, if you were in a casual term or seasonal type of job compared to what we call a regular job, not having these characteristics, it was almost a five-fold increased odds of not having any benefits in your job see that that was even stronger if you were not in a job with a union or a collective agreement. Similar findings, if you were in a job that you thought you were going to lose your job in the next six months, so job insecurity, that you were also um, not likely to have any employment benefits to fall back on uh, in those situations. So again, just demonstrating the vulnerabilities here. 
Uh, I know it's not news to most people, but that all adjusting for all other factors, these precarious work characteristics were clear determinants of not having any benefits. Um, again, just highlighting from the public health perspective, the issues that have arisen and been magnified during this pandemic. Uh, this is again, our findings from that survey that the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives has done here in BC. Um, uh, documenting, um, I think it was a surprise maybe for me, I did not realize these statistics that almost one third of workers um, in the typical working age group had worked multiple jobs at the same time in the previous three months. And we now know that that's an issue, uh, an issue from, um, it's an issue from an employment perspective, work quality, but it's also an issue from a public health perspective here in BC that uh, one of the contributors to the spread of transmission uh, were workers who transitioned between multiple job sites um, and, uh, and that contributed in terms of exposure opportunities for COVID-19. And that uh, was particularly true in the long-term care sector, but in other sectors as well. So these kind of un these, um, less than ideal working conditions are now becoming a public health issue as well. I just want to um, illustrate, I think, one other example here of the increased vulnerabilities. This was Statistics Canada's uh, recent Canadian Perspective Survey, purposely designed to look at the impacts of COVID-19, a general survey um, of the population early in the pandemic. They're continuing to do cycles of it. So we just quickly looked at some analyses of these data. Um, and in particular, highlighting uh, that immigrant workers were all universally across all the indicators that we looked at compared to Canadian born workers, more likely to report adverse impacts, all things being equal. Here, just illustrating for you, um, more likely uh, to report uh, their, their finances would be impacted by the pandemic, uh, almost a 10% increased difference between immigrant workers versus Canadian-born workers. I just want to shift gears here a little bit and just talk about um, uh, workers with disability um, and the, um, the, uh, how the pandemic has highlighted uh, the magnified the vulnerabilities here as well. Um, this is a rapid review in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, by some of our colleagues here affiliated with the CRWDP, Norman Uche, um, looking at the impacts of COVID-19 on people with uh, physical disabilities. And I'll just pause here to allow you to read the summary of the findings for just a moment. So again, I, I don't think it's surprising to us that the impact has had, a, that the pandemic has had an impact on access to healthcare and has changed lifestyle uh, behaviors and patterns. And I think the more telling thing here is the lack of research on the issue that there was a lack of early research in a time of burgeoning research on COVID-19 impacts um, for people with physical disabilities and that there's a need for this research to inform public health recommendations and policy decisions. Uh, I do want to uh, also talk about this work from Statistics Canada, also looking at the impact of COVID-19 on persons with disability, this being, uh, again, another survey of the population, an online survey. Just some highlights, again, I'll let you pause to read these. Dan, can I ask if my, um, 
seeing the panel, the thumbnail panel of video, is that blocking people's view of my slides? Uh, no, from my screen, I can see your full slide. Okay, thanks very much for letting me. You're welcome. So just highlighting for you here, in particular findings really from that survey related to work for people with disabilities. So reporting job losses or reduced hours. This is something that everybody is experiencing, but um, this was magnified for people with disabilities. And by all accounts in uh, these statistics during the pandemic are um, worse, higher, uh, than they were before the pandemic. So relying on non-employment income or our emergency benefits at this time, uh, households with children among people with disabilities impacted in terms of their income. Those with multiple long-term conditions having more reduced hours. And again, this issue of decreased access to therapies and services. I'm going to shift gears now slightly in the last couple of minutes of my presentation to talk about other work that we have been doing um, with regards to uh, risk of transmission of COVID-19, so, but trying to identify high risk occupations. And this issue was really highlighted for us um, when we realized that the, as part of case reporting, at least in British Columbia, that they did not collect occupation um, as part of those uh, case reporting for a, a host of reasons. And when they started to do it, they were doing it solely for healthcare workers. And, uh, there's a lack of information about uh, occupation among cases. And so um, in an effort to try and address that, um, we did a study, a kind of novel uh, case surveillance uh, method of using media reports to look at where uh, workers uh, were reporting an outbreak of COVID-19. So we scanned the literature between February and almost to the end of July of this year. Uh, these were all North American media reports, COVID-19, um, identified almost 400 articles that described 220 unique outbreaks during that time. And those reports were all um, extracted, the media reports, and coded by uh, industrial and occupational hygienists to the National Occupational Classification System. So what I'm just showing for you here, um, there is a whole list of the occupations that reported a COVID-19 outbreak among workers during that time. But I'm highlighting for you here the kind of top ones just to illustrate what the media reports were picking up in terms of the specific occupation occupations that were reporting being at risk for an outbreak of COVID-19. Some of these you will have been hearing about in the media, they're not new um, in terms of the meat and poultry processing plants, uh, healthcare workers for sure. And then you're starting to see some other occupations uh, starting to percolate um, as a result of the, the pandemic and working with the public uh, in particular. We were also interested, um, we did uh, survey uh, the media reports as much as we could for additional vulnerabilities and reporting for you here that a quarter of all of those media articles mentioned um, workers who were immigrant workers or temporary foreign workers as part of the outbreak. The other thing that we were interested in um, was how what we were finding might compare to other risk assessment tools that were trying to identify high-risk occupations. And we did that two ways. One um, was the Vancouver School of Economics Risk Assessment Tool. Uh, they've taken uh, labor force data um, and assessed risk by all of these national occupational classifications by a whole range of risk factors, such as whether they work with patients, work with the public, uh, whether people in those occupations are more likely to live with a healthcare worker, whether they're more likely to take transit, whether they're more likely to live in a crowded household, all of those factors to assess their risk of COVID-19. 
So we compared what we were finding in the media reports with their risk assessment. And I'm not highlighting here the ones that were classified as very high or high risk where there was agreement, but starting to show here where there was some disagreement where the Vancouver assessment tool, Vancouver School of Economics assessment tool, assessed it as kind of medium low or medium risk out of a scale of 100. You can see here that their tool assessed individuals in these meat processing plants as kind of medium risk, whereas they were the dominant report emerging out of the media. You can see some others here that um, we found in media reports that were assessed as medium or low risk than the tool. We show you also here out of the Vancouver tool that were assessed as medium low risk and where we were seeing frequent reports of unique COVID-19 outbreaks by occupation, particular in food uh, processing and in material handling kinds of occupations. A smattering of others there as well, but in particular assessed by some risk factors as medium or low, but we were seeing them frequently in our media reports. And finally, those that were assessed as very low or low risk, where we were seeing frequent reports in the media of outbreaks of farm workers in particular or greenhouse or nursery workers. The other tool that we tried to look at was to compare the outbreaks that we were seeing in North American media reports with claims in our workers' compensation system here in British Columbia. Not that these are the same individuals or the same working environments, but that if they're at risk, we should be seeing these occupations, both as reported in the media, but they should be showing up in the claims data in BC if they too are at risk here in British Columbia. And what you'll see here is our comparison of where we were finding both outbreaks in the media as at risk and, and workers were submitting claims to WorkSafe BC uh, for COVID-19. And so you'll see our, our butchers, poultry preparers there, you'll see healthcare workers, you'll see our farm workers, and you'll see some emergency services or essential services in, in this table. What I'm going to show you here are the occupations that were showing up in the media that did not at that time have a workers' compensation claim in BC. And what I've underlined here, it's not so much that you read through the full list, but underlying common occupations across different industries. So operators in food and beverage processing, operators in transit, operators in oil and gas, and then you start to see laborers in processing and manufacturing, laborers in construction trades, laborers in mining, and so on and so forth. And you start to see assemblers in electronics, assemblers in mechanical, assemblers in motor vehicle operations. So these were showing up in the media reports, but not in compensation. We, we had a, a series of experts in occupational industrial hygiene review those results for the occupations that were independently identified in the media uh, that were not showing up um, in as high risk uh, in the Vancouver tool and uh, School of Economics tool or in the workers' compensation claims data. And the, the commonality there were that these were large working environments, typically plants, factories, warehouses, with close proximity to co-workers, but not patients and not necessarily engaging with the public. And that's the difference in terms of the Vancouver School of Economics tool, in terms of placing them at a higher risk level. Um, there are emerging challenges in these types of working environments with regards to physical distancing and personal protective equipment. And generally, these occupations tend to be lower income have precarious employment characteristics and have fewer employer paid benefits. And while these workers were not in direct contact with patients or the public, they were at risk as a result of workplace community transition. So kind of 
trying to summarize up here in terms of why I want to keep these findings, continue to highlight these issues as I think now is the time to, to really try to pressure. I know we have some made some changes as an emergency response to the pandemic, but to really look at significant changes or reform with regards to paid sick leave and employment insurance, um, because this probably in our lifetime may not be our last global pandemic. And, and separate from pandemics, we still have workers in situations that are vulnerable without access to these benefits, regardless of a global pandemic. So that now is the time to try and make change more broadly. So I just, that's part of the reason of why I want to raise these discussion points. I'm going to stop there with thanks uh, to all of my colleagues across these organizations for their work uh, in this regard. And I will stop now. I'll turn off my video and mute myself to turn it over to Rodrigo for uh, his presentation. Thank you very much. And I understand we'll have questions towards the end. Thanks. So first of all, um, I would like to to thank the Center for Research on Work Disability Policy for this invitation. It's a great um, honor for me to be here presenting. So today I'm going to present a study that we did with my colleagues um, in my home country in Chile. This is mainly an exploratory study about remote work and psychosocial risks. Um, here they are mainly called on determinants and the determinants, the social determinants of health. But in my home country, we are we call it on psychosocial risks mainly. So, first of all, let's have a look at the socioeconomic context. So here we are talking about my home country, Chile. The GDP is on in Canadian dollars like twenty thousand. The Gini coefficient is around fifty. That means that it's a very unequal country. Um, um, so it's one of the most unequal countries in in the world. My home country. The income, the minimum income sits around $5,000 per year, and the median is around $8,000 per year. In terms of the economy, it's a neoliberal model. That means that all that public resources have been completely or partially privatized. So here we are talking about healthcare, education, water, electricity, pension, highways. And in terms of work and healthy, we have the same model as here in Canada, that's the German model. So it's a no for compensation system, collective liability, employer funding, compulsory insurance, medical and wage replacement benefits. The difference um, between my, the system in my home country and the Canadian system is that here you have a state monopoly in each province. In my home country, we have a public and private workers compensation boards at the same time. So there's some differences um, in the way they work and particularly in the way that people underreport, misreport the litigations and the deeming process that disable people from getting benefits. That changes a little bit, but in essence, it's almost the same thing. In the COVID-19 context, and Chile's population is 19 million people. The cases on per 100,000 people, it's, um, it's very high, 3,000. It ranks 30th um, worldwide. Total cases, 500,000 cases. Here in Canada, I guess it's around 300,000. The deaths per, deaths per 1 million people is 800. We are in the top 10 worldwide. The total deaths is 15,000. Here in Canada, it's like 12,000, more or less. And in terms of the lockdown, we have had a complete lockdown for four months. And now it's followed by some partial lockdowns. So I'm giving you this context so you can have an idea of the place that we are talking about. Uh, it's a poor country with, um, with few um, public resources and a system that has been um, privatized and almost completely in, in healthcare. So let's have a look at the study itself. So the purpose of this study is to explore the presence and extent of psychosocial risk in the novel remote work environment. Here we say explore rather than describe because we were not able at that time to create a, a sample in a, in a good way in order to describe exactly what's going on. So mainly we were just exploring the remote work environment. Why we had this interesting interest? Because at that time and when the lockdown um, came, 
the government and workers' compensation boards, they were cheering up um, remote work as the great solution. But the people that are able to do remote work in my home country, they are a tiny group of privileged people. And although they are privileged, we're gonna see that there are many risks involved with remote work. The methods. So we had this an online self-administered questionnaire structure on the basis of closed-ended and Likert scale in order to um, collect primary data. We use a, a non-probability sampling. It's a convenient sampling and it was distributed mainly by social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, and emails. So that was the only way that we were able to distribute um, this um, questionnaire. And this took place when the complete lockdown was um, taking effect in my home country. So we had this questionnaire available from June 7 to the 20th. So we were just, um, when the, log the complete lockdown was beginning, we were able to come up with this questionnaire in order to um, do this exploratory research. The sample is composed by 479 participants and the completeness rate was 88%. That means that um, 420 questionnaires were fully completed. And it was divided between 62% um, women and 37% men. The demographic characteristics, you can read it over here. Mainly, we're talking about 48% of the sample corresponding to workers between 40 and 49 years old. 60% of the sample is employed under a limited term contract and 53% of the sample lives with his or her partner and children. So we can see that it's mainly a traditional kind of structure of the family, the main people that were responding um, to this um, questionnaire. So now let's go over what social risk dimensions we were measuring. Here we are just measuring four of them. The demand latitude, the reward latitude, control latitude, and the social support latitude. So two questions for demand latitude, two questions for reward latitude, three for the control latitude, and three questions for social support latitude. It was a very brief and short questionnaire because um, we thought that we were not able um, to have people responding uh, to a long questionnaire, and especially under the conditions that it was taking place. And also we were measuring the symptoms. We were measuring physical, physical mental, and social health symptoms. So these were mainly the four latitudes and the four dimensions of psychosocial risk that we measured and the symptoms. Now, the risk scale, here we used, we used a color scale. So red is high risk, light red is risk, then neutral, and light green is no risk, and the green is absolutely no risk. Now, this changes a little bit with the Likert scale. And I'm going to explain this before giving all the um, responses, the results. So everyone knows that when you're using a Likert scale, you have positive and negative statements. So the, the colors are going to allow you to understand the nature of the risk in terms of the responses. So for example, here with a positive statement, I have the chances to talk with my colleagues about the problems I experienced while working remotely. Strongly agree, it's in green. Why? Because it means that that's under that positive statement, people that strongly agree with this statement, that would be green, and the amount of people read would be strongly disagree. However, if we have this statement as a negative statement, I have no chances to talk with my colleagues, strongly agree would be red. So the nature of the color and changes depending on the negative and positive statement. So and we made this up in order to make it very clear with the results to know where is the risk in, in terms of the risk scale and in terms of the negative and positive statement. Also with each of the responses on the left side, you're gonna see the, um, the latitudes. So this one corresponds to the social support latitudes. So you can relate on all the answers with the psychosocial risk dimension. So let's go over all the um, responses. Question number one. I have the necessary working conditions and resources to perform my job at home. So 44% agree, st strongly agree, 39 agree, seven neutral, 8% disagree, and 2% strongly disagree. Question number two, 
I enjoy the necessary autonomy and independence to successfully perform the tasks that remote work demands. 38% strongly agree, 41% agree, 10% neutral, 8% disagree, and 3% disagree. In the dimension of the demand latitude, I work with higher intensity or longer hours than I used to before beginning work remotely, to work remotely. 38% of people strongly agree with this statement, so that would be a risk. 27% agree, 17% neutral, 14% disagree, and 4% disagree, strongly disagree. In the demand latitude as well, this question is about um, my job responsibilities have increased as a result of working remotely. Here we have 22% um, of people strongly agree, 28% um, of people agree, 27 um, neutral, 17% disagree, and 6% strongly disagree. My income adversely changed with the shift to remote work, 12% strongly agree and 14% agree. Then we have question number six. I have been able to balance remote work with joyful and all recreational activities that allow me to unwind and relax. 24% of people disagree and 9% of people strongly disagree. I'm gonna read just now, um, just the part of the risk so we can go a little bit um, faster because if not, I'm not gonna have enough time. Question number seven, I get the necessary feedback from my boss, colleagues, or clients to effectively guide my job duties. 17% um, of the sample disagree, and 6% of the sample strongly disagree. So that would be the risk over here. Question number eight, I have the chance to talk with my colleagues about the problems I experienced while working remotely. 10% of people disagree, and 2% strongly disagree. Question nine, remote work has increased my personal conflicts and or disputes within my working group. 4% of people strongly agree and 15% strongly and agree. Oh, the first one was strongly disagree, agree, and the other are just agree. Question 10, I am economically well rewarded for remotely performing my job at home. 17% of people disagree 7% of people strongly disagree. Now, in relation to the symptoms, I have experienced muscle aches or other physical discomfort due to remote work, like back pain, lumbago, tendinitis, visual problems. 32% of the people strongly agree with this, and 37% strong agree. So this is, a, this is huge. It's like 68% um, like of the sample. Question 12, I have experienced mental health issues, stress, depression, anxiety, irritability. Strongly agree, 24%. Agree, 41%. Also, this one is very high. Question number seven, the um, social malaise. So I have experienced symptoms of social malaise, loneliness, isolation, lack of social support. 7% of the sample strongly agree and 22% agree. So let's have a comparative result. So in this chart, the total risk equals high risk, the red, and the risk that is the light red. So we were summing up both risks in order to have the total risk. And here we, have, we can compare the responses in terms of each of the dimensions. Mm -hmm. So we can see that mainly the, the higher risk sits in the demand latitude. Question number three and question number four. In the total sample, question number three that is related to working long, in hour, long hours and more intensity, it's 65%. Question number four is related to re the responsibilities. So that's 50%. So in this case, the demand latitude is the um, dimension of social risk that, um, is, that has the highest exposure in terms of um, remote work. Now, in terms of the symptoms, the total symptoms equals high symptoms, that is the red, and the symptoms, that is the light red. So in terms of physical symptoms, that's the highest one. 69% of, um, of the sample responded, reported um, 
physical symptoms. That's a lot. And in the, in the case of mental symptoms, there was a little bit less, 65%. And social symptoms was 29%. Now, if we compare the results by gender, so what we were doing here, we, we were having the total male risk that is the percentage of the male population um, that had um, high risk and that, that was the red and light and, and risk that was the light red. And for the total female risk, the same thing is in terms of the percentage of female that had um, high risk and risk. So here we are comparing both percentages. So what, what can we see here? is that almost in all of them, the women have higher risk. For example, in the demand latitude, question number three, the percentage point of difference between both percentages is eight. And then we have 11 percentage point, but the highest one was in question number six. It was 23 percentage point um, between men and women. And I want to show you what was that question about. So let's go very fast to question number six. So here, women are reporting much more risk than men. And it says, I have been able to balance remote work with joyful and recreational activities that allow me to unwind and relax. Why do we think that this is one of where we have the biggest and gender gap? It's mainly because in my home country and all the household are doing mainly by women. So in an environment of remote work, of course, women still, still doing all the household so they have and less um, time in order to relax because once they um, finish their um, their work, they have to do the household, the household chores and all that kind of um, domestic labor. So that's why that's what that's our explanation for this huge gap between men and women. In terms of social support latitude, we can see exactly the same thing that mainly women are still um, worse than men. Although in question number seven, this is the only um, dimension where men are doing worse than women. But in all the others, it's always women that are having a uh, biggest exposure. In terms of the symptoms, the same thing. And particularly the, the hugest, hugest gap takes place here with physical symptoms. The gap, the gap is 23% point. So 80, almost 80% 80 of the women, they report physical symptoms. And in the case of men, it's just 50%. So here we have a difference of 23 percentage point. So what are the conclusions of this, um, this exploratory study about psychosocial risks and this work um, remote environment? It's mainly that remote work is not a psychosocial risk-free work environment. Under remote work, men and women are greatly exposed mainly to high demand, that is high intensity, longer hours, and more responsibilities. And our second conclusion is that remote work is not a gender neutral work environment. Under remote work, women are disproportionately exposed to psychosocial risks, particularly the struggle to balance remote work with recreational activities. So those are mainly our two conclusions that we extracted from this um, exploratory study that we did in my home country, Chile. So thank you so much. And now we're gonna do the Q and A. Yeah, thank you very much, Mika and Rodrigo. So we'll go to the Q and A now. We already have a number of questions coming up. So I'll get right into them. Uh, the first one comes from Steve and uh, it's for Mika. Steve says, thanks Mika. Can you explain more on one of the slides? There were over 50 outbreaks in meat processing, et cetera, but only 13 or so WCB claims. Did I understand correctly? Yeah. So yeah, just to clarify, the 50 plus outbreaks were outbreaks across North America. So we did not expect to see um, all of those cases showing up in the workers' compensation system of British Columbia. Rather, what we were trying to do was to see if the same occupations were showing up. Not that we'd expected all of those media cases to show up in the British Columbia system, because the media was North America wide. So we were using the media to try and identify high-risk occupations whether we could get at that through the media reports. And then we were saying, so if these are high-risk occupations, 
broadly in North America, we should be seeing them in the claims data. And we use BC because we had access to it. So I think we were comforted by what that slide was showing, which is those groups that had outbreaks were reporting um, in BC, those occupations were similarly reporting um, for compensation. Uh, in, so we weren't expecting the numbers to line up exactly, but rather we were expecting the occupations to show up in the compensation system. Where we're more concerned is where they're not showing up, where it looks like in a North American context, an occupation is at risk for workplace community transmission, but they're not showing up in the compensation system, either because they don't realize, based on the nature of their work, that they may be eligible for compensation benefits, um, or that it's not adjudicated as more likely than not related to being at work, which is plausible. Um, and so uh, we were more concerned with the graph where there were the laborers, the assemblers, the operators who were not showing up in the compensation claims data. Thanks. Thank you, Mika. So our next question is for Rodrigo. Uh, David is wondering if there is a link to your study, Rodrigo. Oh yeah, there's a link to my study. I can send it, but unfortunately it's in Spanish. So I translated everything um, from Spanish to English, but no problem, I can send the link and afterwards, but it's it's a report that is mainly in, in Spanish, but yeah, I can send it, no problem. Great, thank you. Um, and then we have a comment from Kathy uh, and a question. Oh, sorry, actually this is for Rodrigo. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Switching to remote work may lead high to higher workloads, higher work demands, and in general, higher exposure to stressful work conditions for many people. Your finding about the gap between men and women may be true for Canada as well. If you were to choose one thing that can be done to try to address this, what would that be? Okay, that's a very tough question. Um, but I would say the following, and one of our conclusions in the case of my country is not that remote working is creating something new. It's just reproducing inequalities. So all the inequalities that we had um, before starting remote working with the um, normal work, there was a huge gap already in my home country between, we, between women and men. So the problem is not that there's something new, it's, that it's the reproduction of inequality. So here we are in a situation that we are having a new work environment that is reproducing the existing differences between men and women in, in terms of salaries, in terms of, um, in terms of the exposure to these psychosocial risks, like um, the demand in terms of um, the, the balance. Well, there's some things that change a little bit with remote working, but it's mainly the reproduction of inequalities. So if, if I would have to say something about how to change this, I would, have, I would change the economy, um, switching from an economy that is based on um, production for exchange in order to have an economy based on the production in order to fulfill on human needs. But that would be a huge <laughs> social um, social um, change. But yeah, I would say that mainly this issue is the reflection of the organization of the economy, particularly in the case of my home country that we have a neoliberal economy where things have been privatized, where people are under the production of these transnational companies that, um, that are extracting resources in my home country. So I would say that that would be like the work in the way that we can um, change the situation, but that would be a structural um, change rather than something that can be done locally. But yeah, I think that this, the difference between men and women are structurally and um, based on capitalism itself. So for me, it's difficult to change this difference unless we tackle capitalists because capitalists in essence is, um, it's a gender project. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a men's project that is based on profit that never took into account issues about the um, domestic labor and reproduction. So the essence of the problem about inequality in the workplace, from my perspective, um, are based on the economic system itself that is capitalism. Thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, our next question is for Mika. So thank you, Mika, for presenting this research. The results should be invaluable for policymakers to try to address the inequalities in health and safety and worker protection 
across occupations and income levels. For example, it is striking that workers in such occupations as butchers and meat cutters may have a high risk of COVID-19 outbreaks and may also have a higher risk of non-reporting to the Workers' Compensation Board. I'm wondering if these inequalities vary a lot provincially. For example, provincial laws for sick leave in Canada may differ, and I'm wondering if these laws vary a lot from province to province. Yes, they do because the employment standards are set at the provincial level. We do have the Canada Labour Code with some protections in there, but uh, things around sick leave are province specific under their employment standards and they do vary. I mean, there's some consistency, I'd say, um, I think most of them hover around five. If you are protected to have un five unpaid sick leave days um, and it varies around that uh, from province to province. Some are three, some might be slightly higher. Uh, so there's protections to take leave, but almost universally it's unpaid leave unless your employer um, provides that kind of benefit. And so it is, um, it's one of the challenges of change is that we are influencing employment standards that exist province by province by province. But I do think with the current situation, it shone a light on that. Even some provinces have responded under the pandemic to change under an emergency or temporary situation, some of these provisions and some have been more generous than others in terms of allowing like 14 unpaid sick leave days. Um, still a challenge in the pandemic, uh, while you may be able to stay at home if you're not getting paid, the pressure to go to work is immense. Um, and the threat of losing work is also immense. So I'll, I'll just say that it's a challenge in that we are influencing employment standards across territories and provinces. Um, but I think there's political will right now as a, an issue across Canada to try and make it better. But it does mean shifting, yeah, um, yeah, 10 provinces and three territories and their employment standards. So it's not easy, I'm not going to pretend it is, but yeah, there is differences uh, in the existing employment standards and there's differences in how they responded to COVID-19 to try and adapt in a temporary way. And if we want to shift it, we are left with trying to influence all of those different policies. No easy feat as Rodrigo is trying to change a whole country as well. <laughs> so, I guess we're both advocating for that in different ways. Thank you. It sounds like there's need for a great deal of systemic change uh, is one of the themes here. Um, yeah. Rodrigo yeah, I think if um, I was just going to say that I think if somebody's looking for, I think the Canadian Labour Congress on their website has a pretty good summary of the sick leave benefits by province um, and some of the COVID-19 changes that they've made, but just as temporary measures. If, uh, people want to look at the provincial differences. Thank you. Thank you. So, Rodrigo, a question for you uh, is about how high the experiences of pain and mental health concerns were due to remote work in your survey. Um, I'm just wondering if, because those levels were so stark, they were so high, if you have thoughts on the reason for that, what it is about remote work that ultimately led to those levels. Mm. Well, um, first of all, I would say um, there's a lot of pressure. Um, there's a lot of pressure that are coming from the companies, corporations themselves. So we think that there's, uh, they are transferring the problem to the people. So this, I mean, this, this, this has been very old. It's like um, the, the relocation of the problem and the blame. Workers' compensation, they used to relocate the blame on workers. So we have this notion about the unsafe act and people are always being um, blamed for the things that um, are happening to them that in reality are related to the social organization of work itself. So now with the, this kind of work environment that everyone in my home country started to do remote work, work and there was no preparation, again, there were a lot of pressure on the companies and there was the relocation of the pressure. So rather than companies being responsible about um, doing remote work, 
the companies, they have completely dismissed their own responsibility about the social organization of work. And that's why it is so high. So let me give you an example. So here in my case, I'm a privileged because I'm teaching online at SFU. So I began teaching at SFU online and with the pandemic. But for me, it was surprising that no one, uh, that my employer, SFU, never took, um, never took in touch with me in order to know how I was going to deal with this kind of organization. I was given all the responsibility. So I had, uh, I had myself, I was very stressed in order how to use all these new technologies and how to do remote work. I didn't have an, a good internet connection. I had to buy an internet connection, but my employer, SFU, didn't, they didn't do anything. So they relocate the responsibility in myself. And that is the problem that is taking place in, I guess, in, in this kind of capitalist environment is the relocation of the responsibility and the blame in the workers themselves. So this practice of relocating all the responsibilities is, again, it's not nothing new. It's part of the capitalist system that, uh, that exploit on wage labor. So um, a capitalist system is based on the exploitation of wage labor. And one of the ways to exploit the wage labor is to, is to put all the responsibilities on people themselves. So that's why this um, high demand and, um, and psychosocial risks are so high, also in terms of the symptoms, physical symptoms and mental symptoms, mainly because corporations put all the effort and all the um, responsibility of the transition on workers themselves. You have to deal with everything. In my case, I have to deal with all my students and I, and I have many problems related to technology, related to the organization of work. And I tried to get in touch with SFU many times, but I have no response. So finally, I am left to do everything by myself. And of course, that increased my stress a lot because all the effort is relocated on myself uh, as a precarious labor. And here you have to take into account that when you are TA, I mean, I am TA, I am TA for just one term. I'm, I am just the, and the epit epitome of uh, um, precarious labor. And I'm also an immigrant. So I had many problems with the issue of the permit work and that SFU, they were also not attending in any way because everything is relocated in wage labor. And I think that that's the essence of the problem with remote work, that all the responsibilities are relocated on the workers and workers, they are left on by themselves to deal with everything. Thank you, Rodrigo. So we are at 1 p.m. now, so we will wrap up the webinar. Uh, before doing that, though, just to both of our speakers, thank you very, very much, Mika and Rodrigo. Do you have any, any last words that you want to share, or do you feel like you've said what you wanted to? Thank you. I have. Great. Uh, Rodrigo, you. for yourself? No, I'm, I'm completely done with everything. Thank you so okay. much for the invitation, and that's great. Thanks. Fantastic. Well, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to have a next webinar at some point in the new year, so please look forward, uh, look to our website and our emails to see when that might be. Otherwise, uh, I hope everyone has a nice uh, holiday season, and yeah, thank you again to our presenters, so bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for your help, Dan.